I'm going to be talking about a topic that's actually going to overlap a little bit with some of the things that we uh, talked about in the, the earlier session, but go into a little bit more depth in some issues relating to evolutionary ethics, which is a, a topic that I've <coughs> uh, researched the history of uh, fairly extensively. Uh, and I looked at uh, my book from Darwin to Hitler was actually, as I told you earlier, was began, I began the research project by looking at evolutionary ethics uh, and trying to uh, look at how they had impacted uh, German thought in the late 19th and early 20th century and how at the time when uh, people in the late 19th century were formulating certain forms of evolutionary ethics, they did see this forthrightly as an attempt to try to formulate an ethics that was going to replace Judeo-Christian ethics, which were one of the most prominent forms of ethics. It also replaced Kantian ethics and other kinds of ethical systems as well, uh, if they happened to be around. Uh, but it was their answer to Christian ethics. And one of the reasons I think uh, this uh, topic is so important is because as I've uh, been involved in apologetics and listening to other uh, people uh, giving Christian apologetics talks and such, it seems like, uh, when, especially if people try to make the argument for morality, uh, that you know, because morality exists, God exists, which is a, a common uh, apologetics approach that's taken. For example, one time when I was at the University of Iowa working on my PhD, uh, Bill, William Lane Craig uh, came to our campus and he gave a talk in which he talked about uh, the existence of morality as being evidence for the existence of God. Uh, and one of the people who responded to him in the question and answer session uh, was pressing him on this point. And, basically took the position that, that ethics had evolved. And so used that as an explanation and so claimed that therefore we, you know, we don't need to uh, believe in uh, God because we have some other explanation for ethics. And as I've, uh, it seems to me that this really is one of the most uh, influential ideas out there today about the origins of morality, if you don't believe in a theistic origin for uh, morality. So uh, also, the other reason this topic is very important is because it is permeating uh, our society in a lot of different ways. Uh, the evolutionary origins of morality is becoming very influential in the universities and academe, also in the popular media uh, to some extent uh, as well. And uh, sometimes in the media, the evolutionary origin of ethics is used as a means to try to justify immoral kinds of behaviors as well. So here's an example. It's a little bit old by now, but this is back from 1994, uh, Time Magazine in the United States uh, with a cover article uh, written by Robert Wright, who was a popularizer of evolutionary psychology uh, in the, back in the, at the time. Uh, and his article was named Our Cheating Heart, uh, and the cover has it as infidelity, it may be in our genes. And the upshot of the article was, the reason that we commit adultery is because we're genetically predisposed to do that. Uh, we're trying to get our genes into the next generation, and so adultery is a way to do that. Uh, and so it's part of the Darwinian process. Selection has selected those that have been, uh, I guess, clever enough to get away with it, I suppose, and, and so that you, it's become genetically uh, ingrained in us. So, and it's not just adultery. There's all sorts of other things that people are coming up with. Uh, uh, alcoholism's in our genes, uh, even though they haven't discovered it. And again, they haven't discovered any genes for these things, of course. Uh, but the notion that it's in our, written in our heredity is kind of a popular idea out there. And uh, in the field of evolutionary psychology, they're constantly coming up with sort of just-so stories as to how these things could have developed uh, all sorts of uh, immoral behaviors. And I'll talk more about some of these later on, too, as we uh, get further in that. So uh, we as Christians, then, need to try to have some answers uh, for these uh, people who are promoting evolutionary ethics and even sometimes even using it to promote other kinds of ideas there. Uh, interestingly, there are some people who've uh, actually been converted to atheism by the evolutionary explanations of morality. And I don't know a lot of examples of this, but historically I have found some examples of this in, in the 
mid-19th century or late 19th century Germany, uh, Karl Kautsky, a famous socialist theorist, was converted to uh, materialism by, his, uh, by a Darwinian explanation for the origins of morality. Uh, before that time, he had thought that Kant's explanation of uh, the uh, theism is based on uh, the existence of morality uh, had some explanatory power, but he thought Darwinism had demolished that. And so now that we can explain uh, morality has, having arisen from naturalistic processes, that then opens the way for uh, then embracing a more materialistic view. Um, now, interestingly, there are some uh, scientists uh, who will argue that uh, science and religion don't overlap in any way. And so there's this idea, Stephen Jay Gould, the prominent Harvard uh, paleontologist, uh, argued for this particular position. He even gave it a special name, non-overlapping magisteria, he called it, N-O-M-A, it was abbreviated, NOMA. And the idea behind NOMA, or non-overlapping magisteria, was that science is one category of knowledge, Religion and morality are, other, are different kind of categories of knowledge, and never the twain shall meet. They, they are completely separate, non-overlapping, as the, the term uh, used there. Uh, so on the science side, you have material cause, everything's caused material causation. It's uh, determined. There's no purpose. There's no teleology or purpose to uh, the events that are going on. In science, we just have explanations based upon uh, the material causation. On the religion and ethics side, uh, you could have intelligent causation uh, with purposes, but again, those are completely separate kinds of explanations uh, that don't overlap in any kind of way. Now, as I would suggest here, evolutionary ethics sort of violates this kind of division that some people claim that they're trying uh, to make there. So uh, here's a a cartoon that illustrates this, I think, uh, pretty clearly about uh, Gould's non-overlapping magisteria. So you have here a clergyman uh, talking with a scientist. Uh, and the, the scientist says, science and religion are non-overlapping magisteria. So he's taking Stephen Jay Gould's position there, that you know they're two separate spheres. And so the clergyman said, that's right. And each can discover truth. So they're both on the same page here. They're agreeing that we, we're not going to, so I'll, the clergyman ostensibly, if you're thinking about this first frame, the clergyman would be saying, okay, I get to talk about religion and ethics, and you get to talk about science. And they don't overlap. We can each have our own sphere. You know, let's not step on each other's toes. You know, we'll just do our own thing. So then the second phrase, so the, the scientist says, that means science shouldn't comment on religious myths and legends. And religious people should leave the science to us and trust our answers. And then he goes, but, and then the scientist says, okay, now that we've got that clear, I'm gonna talk about the evolution of religion and moral values. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy says, that's not, remember, I do the science. <laughs> so you got this non-overlapping magisteria where the reality is that science starts creeping over and taking over all of these things. And interestingly, Stephen Jay Gould uh, himself violates his own principle uh, in his book called Wonderful Life, The Burgess Shale and the Nature of History. He makes this very interesting argument where he claims uh, that uh, the reason that we as humans exist is because in the Burgess Shale, this one particular fossilized uh, chordate uh, was saved from extinction. And, it's called, and so he argues that evolution is contingent, that it's accidental, happenstance, and that's how humanity uh, came about. But then, interestingly, and by the way, that has some interesting philosophical implications uh, that maybe already violates his noma, but then he actually does clearly violate it in the end of the book. Because at the end of the book, he argues that because of contingency, because that everything is a, the product of chance, he says that we as humans have the freedom to make our own choices and to choose our own morality, essentially. And so uh, if you read the last pages of Wonderful Life, it's dripping with philosophical and ethical and moral conclusions uh, there that really do violate his own principle that he claims he's uh, putting forward of you know, not overlapping uh, these two 
uh, different things. And certainly, if we, when we're approaching the whole issue of evolutionary ethics, the sci science and ethics obviously is overlapping uh, pretty uh, clearly. Uh, so let's sort of step back now and, and look just a little bit at about how, we, uh, how evolutionary ethics has developed then over, uh, historically, since I'm a historian. I've got to get the historical perspective here of, of how we got there to this point. Well, Charles Darwin, interestingly, uh, was from the very start of his search for evolutionary processes and then trying to figure out what the mechanism of evolution was, he was very concerned about human evolution, even though he, in The Origin of Species, he hardly said anything about human evolution. That was a tactical move because he was not wanting to alienate his uh, contemporaries. So he wanted to sort of push off the question of the evolution of humans to a later time after he'd been able to get people to agree on the evolution of other kinds of organisms. So on the, right at the end of Origin of Species, he just says very briefly you know, that this may throw light on the origins of humans or something like that. It's a very, very brief discussion. Hardly says anything about humans in the entire book. Now later, 12 years later in, in uh, The uh, Descent of Man, he does discuss human evolution pretty uh, uh, extensively. But Darwin, if you look at his notebooks, was wrestling with the idea of human evolution from the very start when he was thinking about evolution. And one of the things that Darwin knew was a big argument against human evolution was morality, the existence of morality. It wasn't the only thing, aesthetics, uh, religion. There were other issues that he had to confront that humans seemed to have something. There was something to be some, seemed to be something different about humans than about other animals. And so he's going to try to explain, uh, in especially in the descent of man, when he starts coming to his explanation of human evolution, he's going to try to have to explain how these things came about. Now he actually, in his notebooks, before, well long before Origin of Species, was uh, making uh, notes about them and trying to uh, make different explanations about. <coughs> ethics and morality. But it's pretty clear, even before he wrote Origin of Species, that Darwin did believe that ethics and morality had evolved, that it was a completely naturalistic process, uh, that there certainly is nothing divine about it, and that it was ingrained in human biological instincts. And so Darwin saw things like cooperation, sympathy, but also aggression as being biologically uh, innate traits. And he thought these had come about through natural selection. Now there's a problem here, especially when you think about his vision of natural selection, because natural selection is based upon competition and the fittest surviving, uh, and those with, uh, who are not fit, not reproducing, surviving and reproducing, I should say, because it has to, be both, has to be survive and reproduce, and those who are not fit, not reproducing, uh, and, and having their uh, characteristics and traits go down to the next generations. So how then can cooperation be passed on uh, hereditarily uh, from one generation to the other? Because it, it would seem that if you're altruistic, that you're you know, giving of yourself for something else, it would seem that that would be a disadvantage to you in the evolutionary story. It would seem like you'd, you'd want to be selfish and want to, you know, you know, to outcompete your uh, others that you are trying to, uh, that you're in evolutionary competition with in the struggle for existence. So Darwin believed that the way to get around that problem was through group selection. Group selection was the idea that, uh, that natural selection operated not just between individuals within society, but that it operated between different societies. So that, uh, as Darwin describes it, different tribes or nations would uh, be in competition with each other also. And so he believed that cooperation could emerge out of this group selection uh, by uh, one group that has cooperative traits, you know, just a little bit more cooperative traits in their genes than others. I mean, Darwin didn't use the term genes, of course, that didn't exist then, but in their hereditary makeup, than uh, the, their neighboring tribe, that they, through their cooperation, would be able through, perhaps through warfare, perhaps through simply uh, you know, producing more foodstuffs, you know, in various kinds of ways, they're going to be able to outcompete you know, their uh, neighboring tribes and thus uh, would have an evolutionary advantage 
and then that cooperation would then be passed on to the next, gener next generations uh, and would become part of an instinct that Darwin referred to as a social instinct, and that's the term that he used to describe this, uh, this tendency toward cooperation that he thought was going to develop uh, between uh, these different uh, peoples. <clears throat> okay, um, so one of the things that uh, is sort of a corollary of this, if, if this is what's happening, if, if this is how uh, ethics have been produced over time, they're part of social instincts, and, and Darwin didn't believe it was just social instincts, he thought that human rationality had then uh, also contributed toward you know, codifying different kinds of morality and such. Uh, but he thought the social instincts were sort of the basis, the, sort of the basis of this. Uh, one of the things that becomes clear is that morality is not anything that's fixed or objective. That morality would change over time in response to whatever the uh, selective pressures would be. So uh, morality would be determined by uh, whatever is able to get the most genetic material, again, that's not his terminology, but that would be the idea, into the next generation. That's going to determine what uh, would be moral for any particular people. So morality is not universal even. And so he didn't even think it was universal among humans. And actually, he says this very specifically. Uh, Darwin believed that certain races had different kinds of morality. Uh, and so uh, when he looked at the peoples, that, and he used the term primitive peoples and such, uh, he thought that their morality was primitive also uh, and that didn't match up to European morality. And he actually does makes, he does actually makes comparisons uh, between European morality and morals and then the morality of those that he sees as more primitive kinds of peoples. So uh, this means that morality is not objective. It's subjective. It's in the su subjective instincts of the people. Uh, and again, it's going to vary from person to person individually and also vary from uh, different societies and races. Now, basing morality on moral sentiments or moral feelings and so wasn't a new idea with Darwin. I mean, he was building upon ideas that had already been in the fund of European thought at the time. Uh, in fact, uh, a number of Enlightenment thinkers, such as David Hume, the prominent uh, British empiricist philosopher of the 18th century, uh, had a similar view of morality that it was largely our feelings, uh, based on feelings and emotions, or what they called moral sentiments at the time. But what was different about Darwin in the uh, 1870s, as he's putting forward this view, early 1870s, was that he was providing a naturalistic account of its origin. That is, Hume never explained how we got those moral sentiments. He thought that that's how morality operated, but he didn't have any account for how uh, humans uh, acquired uh, morality in the first place. And also, Enlightenment thinkers like Hume and many others didn't believe that morality was changing over time, uh, and they uh, were generally believing that it was universal, that it was applicable to uh, humans everywhere. So Darwin was going to introduce some interesting changes into thinking about morality, even among secular uh, philosophers. Now, Darwin, in his uh, uh, autobiography expressed uh, something about how this, this sort of what I could maybe call relativistic view of, uh, of uh, morality, although maybe that's not quite the right word because he didn't think it was relativistic in the sense that you could just choose what morality you wanted to have. He thought that there was some biological uh, substrate to it. Uh, but on the other hand, he certainly didn't think that it uh, was uh, universal or that it was objective. And so in his autobiography, here's what he says about morality. He says that one can have for his rule of life, as far as I can see, only to follow those impulses and instincts which are the strongest or which seem to him the best ones. So we follow our instincts. And so he's saying that that's really the only moral rules we can have uh, for ourselves. Now, uh, interestingly, Darwin, being the good Victorian that he was, thought that the strongest moral instincts uh, in humans was the golden rule. He says this explicitly. 
uh, that the golden rule, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, he thought that was the strongest moral instinct. And so that he wasn't, he wasn't saying here when he says follow your impulses and instincts, he wasn't saying, he wasn't thinking in his own mind about you know, going out and raping, murdering, pillaging. That wasn't what he was thinking about. He was thinking about doing good to others, you know, loving other people. And so he thinks that's our strongest instincts, and that's the ones that we should be following there. However, uh, I should note, and I'm not the only one to note this, uh, that Darwin's vision of morality here, following your impulses and instincts, uh, does have a problem. That is, what about those people that do have impulses and instincts that may not be the golden rule? Okay, what about the Genghis Khans of uh, society, who, by the way, did leave lots of progeny. I mean, Hitler didn't leave. Hitler only left one son, uh, who committed suicide. Uh, but Genghis Khan left lots of progeny, so he was evolutionarily fit. Uh, and Genghis Khan said that he loved to rape and pillage and to just annihilate his enemies and such. Okay, Darwin is a kind, gentle, uh, kind English gentleman. He's not promoting Genghis Khan. Okay. He's promoting the golden rule. But still, his vision of where morality comes from and of eventually what you have to do really doesn't leave any bulwark against someone else who has different feelings of impulses. You know, so if Genghis Khan says, my impulse tells me to go out and rape, pillage, and destroy my enemies. Uh, there's really nothing here in Darwin's view of ethics that can give him a moral fulcrum to say, that's not good, that's not right, that's not good. You know, that's, there's, obje there's something objectively wrong about that because he's undermined any kind of objective morality. Okay. Um, interestingly, uh, Darwin also, uh, in constructing his theory, uh, believed that the struggle for existence among humans would continue on. Again, he didn't think it had to be rapacious, uh, killing like Genghis Khan's kind of vision of uh, humanity, but he did think there was competition, and that competition was necessarily competition to the death, because natural selection only worked when you had an excess of population more reproducing than can survive, the Malthusian population principle that he was building his theory upon, and then uh, those that are more fit survive and reproduce, those that are less fit perish before they're able to reproduce in any kind of way. Uh, so Darwin did see death, interestingly, as promoting progress, evolutionary progress. Uh, so that's an interesting point about the morality, but I'll, I'll sort of just leave that, although I, I can't really develop that a lot right now, although I develop it in some of my other works later on. In any case, Darwin's ideas were going to be picked up by a lot of evolutionary thinkers in the late 19th century. Uh, Ernst Haeckel, the leading German Darwinist, whom I mentioned in my uh, talk earlier, largely agreed with Darwin's view of uh, the development of morality and ethics. Uh, however, interestingly, he thought that uh, Christian ethics stressed altruism too much. And he actually was critical of Christian ethics because he thought it was promoted love, the love ethic, in, in too great a degree. And so he's not totally in agreement with Darwin in that respect, because Darwin would have said the golden rule is sort of the uh, a thing that evolution has led us to. Uh, but Heckel actually stressed that we need to also balance our altruism with self-preservation, and so basically selfish ideas. He thought that the instincts for self-preservation were sort of equivalent to the instincts that would be sort of altruistic uh, among humans. So, uh, but largely, he's still going to embrace the same basic idea of the evolutionary origin of ethics. And because of his views, Heckel was going to become one of the earliest proponents of eugenics and even euthanasia. Uh, in his 1870 edition of Natürliche Schöpfungsgeschichte, he uh, promoted the killing of those with uh, people with disabilities, uh, for example. Uh, and he s argued that this was a way to, to help evolution along. I think I've my a slide here showing the eugenics. And by the way, this is overlapping a little bit with my talk uh, that I just gave. Uh, but uh, eugenics sort of fits into the evolutionary ethics because 
of this, the way that people in the eugenics movement were interpreting evolutionary ethics. They were the ones that were writing about evolutionary ethics, the people in the eugenics movement in the early 20th century as well. So by the time we move into the 1890s and the first two decades of the 20th century, most of the people writing about evolutionary ethics were in the eugenics movement. And so here we see this uh, poster that came out during, I think this was the third, might have been the second, uh, but anyway, uh, International Eugenics Congress that was held in New York City. Uh, this was one of their uh, placards that said, eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. And so the idea is that we're now trying to determine who is uh, superior, and we are going to uh, sort of use artificial selection to sort of help out natural selection. So it's sort of undarwinian in one sense, by the way. And a lot of people argue this too, by the way, and, and, I, and I, I, I understand this perfectly, that there's a sense in which eugenics is undarwinian in the sense that it's saying that we're going to use artificial selection. Darwin actually, when confronted with Galton's ideas, Darwin actually said that he didn't think we needed to use artificial selection because he thought natural selection would take care of all, these, of all the problems. That even in cases, and he gives some examples in The Descent of Man, that even in cases where you know, certain uh, individuals who seem to be less evolutionarily fit uh, are out reproducing, which by the way, that's actually a contradiction in terms, but <laughs> that is how they talked at the time, that were out reproducing those that were less evolutionarily fit, uh, that he said, or I said that backwards, that those that were less evolutionary fit were out reproducing those that were more evolutionary fit, which by the, is a, again a contradiction, but that is how they talked, uh, that uh, he said he still thought natural selection ultimately would take care of that problem, that ultimately natural selection would kick in and those people with the, these negative traits that he thought were negative or lesser, inferior or whatever would ultimately get weeded out. And so Darwin's uh, approach was to just uh, continue on and allow natural selection to take its course. And so Darwin wasn't a big fan of uh, trying to promote eugenics in the sense of artificial selection. Is there a question? Just Say the same? Question. Yeah. What is the difference between natural and, let's say, non natural, let's say, because if we are part of the nature, yeah. The question was, what's the difference between natural selection and artificial selection? Because if we're part of nature, then we're part of the selective process. Well, I think the difference is the way that we're thinking about the selection, the way that we're thinking about the selection that's going on. So the natural selection that Darwin and others are talking about, that they're, they're wanting to rely upon, is simply just letting nature take its course without us defining which individuals are fit letting nature decide which individuals are fit, letting the environment decide. But you're right, we are part of the environment too, so there is a, there is a problem with that as well. And artificial selection was the idea of, okay, we'll identify the, the people with certain genetic traits, certain illnesses, weaknesses, or whatever. We will then weed them out and get rid of them uh, and such. So, in fact, you, you look at the eugenics movement and there was all sorts of uh, fear about different kinds of genetic traits. I mean, there was one, there was one uh, German eugenicist that I was reading one time who was talking about the fact that, that uh, eyeglasses, like I'm wearing right now, he said were sort of detrimental uh, because it's allowing people to survive and reproduce who otherwise would be, you know, lose, the, the, uh, lose the competition in natural selection. <laughs> and so uh, it's a bad thing that we're you know, giving people, it's a bad thing that we're pe putting people in asylums and keeping them alive because you know, they're now going on reproducing. You know, this, it's a, they're talking about all these different things that uh, could be bad. But obviously you're right though, we're, that's part of the environment, that's part of what uh, the selective pressures are created by us in that kind of way, but a lot of them, a lot of them were very interested, and, and by the way too, it, another thing about the eugenics movement too that, that strikes me as well, is that the eugenics movement has this idea of teleology built into it, that is the idea that there's some purpose toward which evolution is moving, it's moving, it, and they'll use terms like progress, and the whole notion of inferior and superior, I mean, in a Darwinian sense, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, and Darwin himself, interestingly, Darwin himself was of both minds on that issue. In his notebooks, Darwin at one point told himself, wrote a note in his notebooks, don't talk about, uh, about higher and lower animals or higher and lower organisms. But then you read The uh, Origin of Species and he talks about higher and lower uh, organisms. And you read The Descent of Man and he talks about higher and lower races and such. So there's this sense of progress and teleology that was almost inescapable in mid-19th century European society. 
uh, and it was sort of built into their way of thinking about things uh, that uh, made it so that they weren't completely consistent, I think, in that respect, too, that, that they're, they're, they're trying to aim at something, claiming that evolution doesn't have an aim. So eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. So we're directing it. Uh, we get to choose now what uh, uh, comes along uh, the way. So uh, I already talked last time about Hitler's view, so I'll sort of skip over that a little bit. I've actually written a book about Hitler's uh, ethic, the Nazi pursuit of evolutionary progress. There obviously were a lot of people who were embracing evolutionary ethics that had nothing to do with Nazis and such. And one of the more prominent examples in the mid-20th century, so a contemporary of Hitler, was Julian Huxley. Julian Huxley uh, was a famous uh, evolutionary biologist in the mid-20th century who became one of the chief architects of what came to be known as the evolutionary synthesis, the modern synthesis. In fact, he actually used that word in his title of his book uh, that he wrote in the 1940s. But in 1943, and Julian Huxley, by the way, also went on to be one of the, the founding director of UNESCO, uh, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, uh, and was a very prominent uh, uh, hu secular humanist. But Julian Huxley in 1943 gave a lecture about evolutionary ethics in which he was supporting the idea of evolutionary ethics. And he actually claimed that the Nazi, he was actually arguing against the Nazi form of evolutionary ethics, which he claimed was illegitimate. He acknowledged that they were trying to formulate evolutionary ethics, but he was claiming there was an illegitimate way of formulating evolutionary ethics. And in that essay, he argued that evolution leads to cosmopolitanism rather than to racism. Now, he doesn't really defend that, by the way. He doesn't really justify it. I, I, I've read this essay, and I can't find anywhere where he says why that's the case, how it is that evolution actually leads to cosmopolitanism rather than racism. But he, he, that's what he, he does state that, and, but he doesn't argue for it there. Uh, but one of the things that's very clear in his own formulations of evolutionary ethics in that uh, famous lecture that he gave was that he clearly did not think that uh, ethics was fixed or permanent. He thought that it was changing over time and continued to evolve over time. And interestingly, unlike Darwin, who thought that the golden rule was where evolution had brought us, uh, Julian Huxley actually specifically criticizes the golden rule uh, in his essay, well, his lecture that became an essay on evolutionary ethics. So he argued that the golden rule is impractical. Uh, he thought that that's just not going to work. Loving other people the way you love yourself, that's just not practical. And so he argued that's not where evolutionary ethics brings us there. But he did clearly argue that uh, ethics is not fixed and permanent and objective. And so that's one of the key points that uh, we've already seen in Darwin and that's going to be characteristic of a lot of other uh, formulations of evolutionary ethics. Um, after Huxley, one of the most key figures in the formulation of evolutionary ethics, which sort of dies down after uh, Huxley's formulation of it. Uh, in the 1970s, it's going to reemerge, though, with E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson at, at Harvard University, uh, who becomes the founding father of sociobiology. Uh, and he's going to re-energize the debate over evolutionary ethics at the time. Uh, Wilson was insisting on a uh, greater measure of biological determinism. Many of you probably are aware of his sociobiological ideas. Uh, he claimed that morality is based primarily upon uh, biological hereditary traits. He himself was a, an evolutionary biologist examining uh, ants, and that was his primary uh, expertise. Uh, and so he was looking at the social instincts of ants and other insects. Uh, and he believed that those social instincts had been uh, formed through evolutionary processes. And Wilson, as well as others in the time, he, was, he wasn't the only one, I don't have time to go into the details here of the historical development of this, but uh, Wilson uh, and others in the 1970s uh, came up with ideas that they thought were able to overcome selfishness. By this time, group selection had pretty much been dismissed as uh, a non-starter. There actually are some biologists today that are trying to resurrect group selection. But by the 1960s and even earlier, really with the synthesis in the 40s, uh, group selection had pretty much been uh, pushed aside for individual selection, that all selection was taking place at the level of individuals, not on the level of groups. 
And so Wilson and others, and again, he wasn't the only one, but he was sort of building upon the ideas of some others, uh, believed that they could overcome the selfishness of humans and get to ethics and altruism uh, through two main means. One was kin selection. That is uh, selection they believed that operated not just on an individual basis, but on a kin basis. So that, uh, that when a person had a, co a gene that gave them more cooperative tendencies, this would benefit their brothers and their sisters and others that shared their genetic uh, material. And so this is a way that cooperation then could uh, come further into uh, the, or could uh, increase over time in an evolutionary sense. The other way, other than kin selection, was reciprocal altruism. That is, you know, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And so people just helping each other, and that then would co contribute over time within society uh, to the development of social instincts. Uh, that could uh, become morality. Wilson and others, though, clearly denied the objectivity and fixity of morality, just like Huxley had earlier, just like Darwin had uh, earlier. Uh, in the 1980s, he co-authored an article with Michael Roos, the famous uh, philosopher of science, uh, in which they said, among other things, ethics as we understand it is an illusion fobbed off on us by our genes to get us to cooperate. And that's a very prominent idea among those embracing evolutionary ethics. That's pretty much a, a pretty standard, really, idea uh, there, uh, that uh, ethics is an illusion. So there's nothing fixed or permanent or objective about it. Uh, and it's something that our genes get us to do to get us to cooperate uh, with others so that we can get our genes into the next generation. So that's pretty much a prominent idea about the way that evolutionary ethics is then developed over time. OK, what I want to do in the, the next uh, portion here is to offer a critique of evolutionary ethics. Okay, I've sort of laid out to you what it is and how it's developed over time. Now, now let me say why I believe there are problems with evolutionary ethics and thus how we as Christians can try to confront evolutionary ethics when we face it. And again, I, I think it's, it's a pretty prominent idea, especially if you try to make arguments for morality, uh, trying to talk to people about the origins of morality and how that points to a god. Evolutionary ethics is one of the main uh, things I think that you may run up against uh, when you start trying to talk to people in this way. So first of all, uh, evolutionary ethics uh, assumes that the basis of morality is biological instincts. And so it generally assumes biological determinism, which means, as we learned in our last, uh, the talk I gave last time too, that it's denying any kind of free will. So, let me give an example of this. Patricia Churchland, uh, who is a neuroscientist who's written a lot of things about the evolution of behavior and such, uh, points to uh, the hormone oxytocin as being a uh, thing that develops social bonding. And there were some interesting uh, experiments that were done. I don't think she did them, but she just relates them about voles, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with this thing, but there were two different uh, species or subspecies, I forgot which one, of voles, uh, that uh, uh, it's a small mammal. <laughs> I, I, is it North American? Maybe just North American mammal, I don't know. Is it a little? Okay, yeah. It's a small mammal. Uh, but there's two different either species or subspecies, and uh, one of those and, and one of those is monogamous, and one of them is polygamous. And they've discovered that the levels of oxytocin that they have determine which of those two they are, whether they're polygamous or monogamous. And so her point is that, OK, this moral behavior, monogamy, polygamy, it's all based upon chemicals. It's just how much oxytocin you know, they have. That's what makes it there. And, and, and interestingly, there are some, uh, there's some transhumanist figures, uh, like Julian Savalescu at Oxford University, a philosopher there, uh, who are, uh, and Churchland does this too to some degree also, who are building upon this to try to say that, you know, maybe we can bioengineer humans by, you know, changing our oxytocin levels and different things, like playing with uh, things like that. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that too much there. But anyway, uh, 
Part of the problem with her, uh, with her uh, spin and when she tries to apply this to humans, in my view, is that uh, the voles, based on their oxytocin level, are always monogamous when they're at a certain level of oxytocin. The other voles are always polygamous. Uh, when we start looking at human culture and society, we find that there's a lot of cultural impacts upon our morality. So, uh, and, and Churchland and others completely ignore the kind of cultural impacts on our morality that change these things. So uh, humans, some societies are polygamous. Some are monogamous. There's no difference as far as I can tell. And they, they've never been able to produce any evidence that there's oxytocin level differences in those different societies. In fact, some of them are the same uh, peoples biologically, just uh, from uh, changing historically from one to the next. And certainly, if we think about marital patterns, uh, we've seen pretty dramatic changes in marital patterns just over the last century. Uh, but no evolutionist would argue that there's been dramatic changes biologically that have produced those uh, changes uh, in our, uh, our uh, marital patterns. So I think there's a basic problem with this idea that morality is simply based on biological instincts or basically this chemical uh, behavior and such. And I would also argue that there's, uh, in, in, against that view of morality just being based on biological instincts, that there's a lot of outrageous claims being made on the basis of this, such as Robert Wright's one that I showed you earlier about uh, adultery being based on uh, uh, biological instincts uh, and such, uh, because the basic assumption is that we have no ability to overcome this behavior, that we're just beholden to our biology, uh, and so you've got this notion that we just can't help ourselves. And if you read the, uh, Robert Wright's article and you read it, basically, he is basically arguing that, that, you know, it's just the way it is. We can't help it. You know, we can't help committing adultery. It's just the way we were programmed by our biology. That's just how we are uh, there. I would also argue, in my critique of evolutionary ethics, that evolutionary ethics tends to spin a lot of uh, tales about the reproductive value of various moral behaviors or sometimes immoral behaviors. Uh, but their tales really don't tell us anything about where those behaviors came from anyway, it, on, one, on the one hand. I mean, if we think about it from a theistic perspective, you know, if God designed morality, it actually would make some sense, and I, I believe this is actually the case, that God designed morality for our good, to benefit us. So just showing that a particular moral trait is beneficial and can help you survive does not mean it came from an evolutionary origin. It doesn't prove that at all. God could just as easily have produced that morality, and that's why it benefits us, because God is wanting us to be benefited by that morality, that moral behavior, or whatever. And so that's why it helps us to survive and reproduce, not because it was produced by an evolutionary <coughs> origin. It also uh, is it also sort of a non sequitur to say, well, this pronotes reproduction, uh, therefore it evolved. Uh, so that doesn't, you really can't get to the, that by there. Also, I would argue that evolutionary ethics is often used to justify various kinds of immoral behaviors. Uh, and again, I've already given the example of Robert Wright, but you know, scripture talks about people calling evil good and good evil and such. One of them that I've seen very prominently on display in evolutionary ethics studies is infanticide. Sarah Hardy uh, at the University of California, Davis, was a primatologist. And she did all these studies on primate behavior. Uh, and what she found uh, was that there are some primates that commit infanticide. And so she then tried to explain, give an evolutionary explanation for uh, why those uh, primates would commit infanticide. And she interpreted it as an evolutionary strategy. So this is a, strat a reproductive strategy of committing infanticide. And the explanations they give, by the way, sometimes are rather imaginative, fanciful. There's really a, not a lot of empirical evidence for some of the explanations they give. But the idea is that they uh, kill off their uh, infants if they think the infants are too weak or are lesser value or if they have other uh, 
they have other offspring to take care of and don't think they can take care of that or something like that. that, that they, and he's not saying, by the way, she's not saying, by the way, that they're doing this on a conscious level necessarily, but that's just how they're programmed to operate. This is how, what's evolved in them. So committing infanticide then is an evolutionary strategy. Now, interestingly, uh, there are those who have picked that up and tried to apply that to human society as well. I've taken that, that, that these primates uh, commit infanticide, so uh, maybe humans are programmed to commit infanticide. And indeed, Steven Pinker, one of the more prominent evolutionary psychologists in the United States, he's at Harvard University uh, now. Uh, in 1997, he wrote an article about why they are killing their newborns. There had been a couple of spectacular cases in the United States, one of which a, a uh, young lady had gone to her high school prom dance, uh, and during, and during the, the dance, she had gone to uh, the restroom to uh, give birth to a baby and then killed it, and just threw it in the trash can. Uh, and that created a lot of horror in American society and got a lot of press and everything. And there was another case that took place, too, about the same time. And so uh, Steven Pinker wrote this article about why they kill their newborns. And Steven Pinker's explanation was that it came about through evolution. And he argued that our Pleistocene ancestors had uh, been living in conditions that uh, required them at times to kill their infants in order to preserve others of their offspring, and that this then was going to produce evolutionary advantage. And he even said that these uh, women would coolly, when they gave birth, that these he's talking here about these Pleistocene women, right? So these women back, these ancient women, would coolly assess the survival value of their babies after they were born to decide whether they would kill them or nurture them. Now, I don't think Pinker had the ability to do any uh, psychological surveys on Pleistocene women. And I kind of, I've, I've never met any women who have coolly assessed their infant babies after being born. Maybe there's some that have. And again, there obviously are people that have killed their babies after being born, so I understand that happens. But the notion that uh, women on the whole would have this evolutionary uh, biological trait developed within them where they would then uh, coolly assess their infants whether they'd kill them or not uh, may make an interesting story about uh, how this could have happened evolutionarily. But again, there's not really a lot of empirical evidence for it. Really, there's no empirical evidence for it in reality. Uh, and also, uh, what about the biological instincts opposing infanticide? What about the fact that most humans reject infanticide? That, you know, Pinker didn't talk about that in his article, nor does Sarah Hardy really talk about that uh, in any uh, great depth as well. So why would this, why would this uh, instinct for infanticide take precedence over instincts to nurture your child and such? Well, again, they're claiming there's a balance. I understand that. But Still, the, the story they give doesn't really uh, make a lot of sense. There's also other examples which uh, seem also kind of fanciful in terms of the explanations for evolutionary origins of uh, moral traits. So for example, E.O. Wilson tries to explain the origins of homosexuality uh, through uh, evolutionary processes. Now that, again, is, is, that seems kind of uh, uh, contrary to what you might think because homosexuality is a reproductive dead end. Right, so uh, why would, how would that uh, give reproductive advantage? Well, according to Wilson, having a homosexual in the family could work in, with kin selection. That is, having someone that is not married and doesn't have kids, they're now free to help, help out their sister, brother, others that share some of their uh, genetic uh, material. Uh, and so he argues that thus it can be beneficial in an evolutionary kind of sense. So they use kin selection to try to, to get around uh, that kind of problem. But there's a number of problems, too, with this view. It seems to me, in specifically about the, the homosexuality issues, that first of all, it assumes that homosexuality is a biological instinct. And I'm not arguing that there couldn't be biological components to homosexuality. There could be. But it's certainly not a proven it's certainly not proven scientifically that that's the case, uh, that, that it's primarily or even uh, predominantly uh, biological. But even if it is, 
That doesn't make it morally justified. Uh, morality, and this is an interesting point I think that a lot of uh, people dealing with evolutionary ethics don't really think clearly about, perhaps. Morality often is at odds with our instincts. So just because something is instinctual doesn't mean it's moral. And in fact, very often we think of things that are instinctual that they're not moral. And that's why we strive against them and we set up our ethical and moral systems to constrain our instincts to keep us from acting instinctually in all sorts of ways. So, you know, we may have an instinct toward, uh, toward aggression, okay, and we do, and I, I, I admit, there's, I believe there is a biological component to that. I'm not, I'm not denying that there's a biological component to aggression. And, and there are hormones that can affect you know, how aggressive a person is. That doesn't mean that it's moral to act out your aggression and take out your aggression on other people. Morality is often trying to constrain uh, these uh, instincts, even if the instinct does happen uh, to be there. Also, what's very interesting is that I've never seen any studies done, and, and again, I've, I've looked at the literature on evolutionary ethics and this thing. I, I don't know of any studies, and if anyone does know of any, I'd be interested in seeing this, but I don't know if anyone's actually studied to actually empirically see if that's actually true. That is, that homosexuals have more, uh, uh, that their siblings have more offspring than non-homosexuals, because that's actually what they're arguing. They're arguing that, that a homosexual's siblings have more offspring because they're able to help them than a non-homosexual's uh, siblings. Uh, there haven't been any studies to, to show, that, show that, so again, we're, they're sort of uh, you know, just making up plot, maybe what might be, might be plausible, but really doesn't have any uh, scientific backing, at least as far as I can tell. I also find it very suspicious that sociobiology does, and evolutionary ethics, usually seems to privilege moral standards that progressive intellectuals share. <laughs> so now, why is that? I mean, Sarah Hardy, whom I mentioned in her primatology study, she wrote a book, uh, I think it's called Mother Nature or something like that, in which she argues that, uh, that evolution is essentially pro-choice. And she believes that it, it's a, a pro-choice uh, mechanism. Now, to, and again, she's arguing for infanticide, but also she believes abortion is also part of that, part of that mix as well. Uh, so, you know, why focus, for instance, on the anti, uh, why focus on the homosexual tendencies of a very small minority of people rather than the anti-homosexual uh, instincts, if you want to call it that, of the vast segments of the population, if they are really instincts. Okay, let me uh, sort of wrap this up here pretty quickly. Uh, one of the points that is made very uh, frequently by people who promote evolutionary ethics, especially James Rachels and Peter Singer, and James Rachels has written this whole book called Creative from Animals and Moral Implications of Darwin. And by the way, this is actually one book that I, that sort of got me interested in this topic in, in looking in further depths in evolutionary ethics and, and the certain direction that I went with it in my research project. James Rachels is a philosopher, he's not a historian, uh, and he doesn't really know much about the history of evolutionary ethics, but he's actually making an argument uh, in this book Created from Animals, which is published by Oxford University Press, uh, he's making an argument that humans do not have privileged status. That because we are created from animals, and by the way the word created from animals, that's actually a term that Darwin himself used in his notebooks. That because we're created from animals, uh, that we're not created in the image of God. And if we're not created in the image of God, then there is no such thing as sanctity of life. And Rachel's as well as Singer are both trying to demolish the idea of the sanctity of human life. And so I don't have time to go into great detail on this, but my book, The Death of Humanity, goes into lots of detail on these issues and how evolutionary ethics has uh, eroded this idea of uh, the sanctity of life. Uh, undermine the Judeo-Christian sanctity of life ethic and thus led us into uh, featuring abortion, infanticide, euthanasia and such. So you've got Peter Singer unsanctifying human life, so destroying the, the notion that humans have any specific value, and then rethinking life and death, the collapse of our traditional ethics. And traditional ethics but there means Judeo-Christian ethics, the notion that human life has particular value. So in wrapping things up then, I would say that evolutionary ethics is a powerful intellectual current in our day, uh, and I would argue it's a very dangerous 
element because it, it does have so much, uh, uh, because it is used to such a degree by people pushing kind of things like uh, promoting various forms of immorality as well as uh, things like abortion, infanticide, and euthanasia on that basis. Even if people today aren't promoting the same things that say Hitler was promoting with his evolutionary ethics, we certainly have a lot of ways that uh, humans are, uh, we're seeing uh, plenty of death and destruction, again, through abortion, infanticide, and euthanasia, as well through these kinds of ideas. So I think we as Christians need to be able to try to provide an answer to those embracing evolutionary ethics as an explanation that usually is in contradistinction to Christian ethics. Okay, thank you for your attention, and now let's open it up for question and answers.